In this lecture, we're going to talk about a couple of bonding issues that don't really fit cleanly anywhere else. We're going to talk about spin state configurations of transition metal ions and Jan Teller distortions. We saw in the last lecture that when we form complexes with transition metal ions, that oftentimes the frontier orbitals, which are the most important for the properties, are the d orbitals on the transition metal ion. Because the energetic splitting of the d orbitals can be relatively modest, the filling of these d orbitals can sometimes take different configurations. Here we're going to talk about the two extreme cases, the low spin configuration and the high spin configuration. Let's consider a transition metal ion in an octahedral environment so that the d orbitals are split into the triply degenerate T2g orbitals, dxy, dyz, dxz, and at a higher energy, the doubly degenerate eg orbitals, the dx squared minus y squared and the dz squared. Now, for the first electron that goes in, there's no ambiguity. It's going to go into one of the T2g orbitals. For the second electron and the third electron, it's the same story. They both go into the T2g orbitals. And Hund's rule tells us that they all have the same spin. Let's say spin up. Now for the fourth electron, we actually have two choices. We can either doubly occupy one of the T2g orbitals, or we could put that fourth electron up here in a higher energy but otherwise empty eg orbital and we get the same kinds of considerations for the fifth and sixth electrons now you might think it would be better to put the electron into the lower lying t2g orbitals but remember that there is a repulsion between electrons and by putting two electrons in the same orbital that's going to be a greater repulsion than if we put them in different orbitals and so that repulsion between the electrons, we're going to call the spin pairing energy, P, and the crystal field splitting between the two sets of orbitals, we're going to call that delta. So when the spin pairing energy is less than delta, it's going to be more favorable to fill up the T2g orbitals completely first before we put any electrons in the EG orbitals. We call that a low spin configuration. When the spin pairing energy is greater than the crystal field splitting delta, then it's more favorable to put one electron in each of the 5d orbitals before we start to pair them up. We call this a high spin configuration. Now, sometimes in the textbook we use this notation, which explicitly shows the comparison between the crystal field splitting delta and the spin pairing energy p. We see over here on the left five horizontal lines that represent the d orbitals, but these can only hold spin up electrons. And then we have another five horizontal lines representing the same set of d orbitals, but these can only hold spin down electrons. And so when the spin pairing energy is less than the crystal field splitting delta, as shown here. You can see we put in the spin up and the spin down electrons into the T2g orbitals before we start to populate the EG orbitals. For the opposite case, the high spin configuration, we see that the spin pairing energy now is greater than delta. And so we populate the T2g spin up and the EG spin up orbitals before we start to populate the spin down orbitals. Now, how do we know if we're going to have a high spin configuration or a low spin configuration? Well, it comes back to the relative size of delta versus P. So let's concentrate primarily on delta. When we have second and third row transition metal ions, where the valence orbitals are the 4D and the 5D orbitals, those orbitals stick out further. They are larger than the 3D orbitals. That's going to give more interaction with the ligands, which is going to give us a larger delta. And also, making the orbital bigger leads to a decrease in P. 
So the second and third row transition metal ions are always low spin. Anything that we do to increase the covalency of the metal ligand bonds, for example, if the bond distance gets shorter, if the electronegativity of the transition metal increases, that covalency is going to make the crystal field splitting larger because the origin of the crystal field splitting is the difference between the pi star interaction and the sigma star interaction. The crystal field splitting for a tetrahedron is only about half as big as an octahedron. And because the crystal field splitting of a tetrahedron is quite small, that means that tetrahedral ions almost always adopt a high spin configuration. And then there's something called the spectrochemical series, a series of ligands that we encounter in inorganic chemistry from these halides down here, which give relatively small deltas to these kinds of ligands like carbon monoxide and cyanide, which have empty pi star orbitals that can lower the T2G orbitals. So as we go from the weak field ligands to the strong field ligands, we increasingly tend to see low spin configuration. We're not going to run into a lot of these ligands in this class, but it's a good thing to keep in mind. OK, let's talk about another subtlety of crystal chemistry that ultimately comes back to this comparison of spin pairing energy versus crystal field energy. Here I show the structures of nickel oxide and platinum oxide, both with the same stoichiometry. Both nickel and platinum are in group 10, right? So they have a total of 10 valence electrons, but they adopt different crystal structures. Nickel oxide has the rock salt structure with octahedral coordination around nickel. Platinum oxide has the cooperite structure with a square planar coordination around platinum. So my question for you is, what is responsible for this difference? Of the different things that might be going on here, one thing that it's not is size. Platinum, being below nickel in the periodic table, is larger than nickel. And we would expect that a larger ion, if anything, might have a higher coordination number. But instead, platinum has a lower coordination number. So the difference in the crystal chemistry here is driven by electronic effects. Now to understand that, let's look at the filling of the d orbitals. So if we have an octahedron, as I show here, and as we have for nickel in the nickel oxide structure, nickel is going to be 2 plus in this compound. And the nickel 2 plus ion has 8 electrons in the 3d orbitals. And so in an octahedral crystal field, they're going to fill the orbitals as shown here. Now, what happens if we go to a square planar environment? Well, we've removed the ligands that are along the z-axis. And to keep the same amount of bonding, we've got to move the ligands that are on the x and y axes in closer to the central metal. So that's going to change the splitting of the d orbitals. The d orbitals that have a z component, like dxz and dyz are going to be lowered energy. They're going to be less antibonding because we've removed the ligands along the z-axis. The ligands that are within the xy plane, like dxy, are going to go up in energy. And then we're also going to split the eg orbitals, and that splitting is going to be even more pronounced. So the dz squared orbital now comes down in energy by a lot. It actually comes below the dxy. And the dx squared minus y squared, which remember is pointing directly at the ligands, is going to go up in energy substantially. So we end up with this electron splitting diagram where we have one d orbital, the dx squared minus y squared, that's forming anti-bonding sigma interactions with the ligands. It's at a very high energy. And then the other four orbitals are all at a much lower energy. So you can see, if you look at it, that a d8 electron count might be a good electron count for stabilizing this square planar environment, because we're filling up the orbitals that are at low energy, and we're leaving empty this high-lying dx squared minus y squared orbital. But on the downside, each of the orbitals now contains a pair of electrons, 
So the spin pairing energy, if you want to think about it that way, the electron-electron repulsions have gotten worse. So for nickel oxide, because the 3D orbitals are rather contracted, especially by the time you get to nickel, the delta is not that large. And so to minimize the spin pairing energy, we go for an octahedral environment to minimize the electron-electron repulsions of pairing up all of the d orbitals. But for platinum oxide, where the 5d orbitals interact strongly with the ligands, the delta in an octahedron would be very large. And so the crystal field splitting drives this distortion, which lowers the energy of the dz squared, and then we can depopulate the dx squared minus y squared. We're going to see square planar coordination come up quite a bit for D8 and sometimes D9 ions that have strong interactions with the ligands. All right, let's switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk about a very famous theorem in inorganic chemistry called the Jan Teller theorem. And the Jan Teller theorem says that if we look at our highest occupied molecular orbital and find it's degenerate and it is partially occupied in such a way that we can move an electron from one orbital to another with no cost of energy. The molecule or the crystal is going to undergo a symmetry lowering structural distortion that's going to remove this degeneracy and allow the electron to occupy the orbital that becomes lower in energy. This kind of distortion in solid state chemistry is sometimes called a first order Jan Teller distortion. And remember the thing about this distortion is we need a partially filled HOMO. We're also, after that, going to talk about something that is a similar kind of distortion, but the difference is it involves a mixing between a HOMO that might be fully occupied and a nearby LUMO that is unoccupied. And the distortion is going to lead to a hybridization between these two orbitals that's going to lower the energy of the filled orbital. Well, let's start with the classic Jan Teller distortion, the first order Jan Teller distortion, a geometry and electron count where this type of distortion is most prevalent would be an octahedral geometry where we have an electron count that's either high spin D4, like for example, a manganese three plus ion, or D9 like a copper two plus ion. Here, I'm gonna illustrate for the D4 configuration. So you can see that the EG orbitals have one electron, and it's arbitrary whether I put it in the dz squared or the dx squared minus y squared. So we have this condition of a degeneracy of the HOMO. Now, I can distort the octahedron to remove this degeneracy. The Jan Teller theorem tells me this is going to happen. What the Jan Teller theorem does not tell us is exactly how the distortion might happen. And here I've drawn two different possibilities. On the left, we have compressed the octahedron. That is, we've made the bonds along the z-axis shorter and elongated the bonds in the xy plane. And so if we focus on these eg orbitals here, we can see that the dz squared orbital goes up in energy the dx squared minus y squared orbital goes down in energy, right? They're both sigma antibonding, but we've reduced the antibonding character of the dx squared minus y squared now. So that will give us an energy stabilization. We could also elongate the octahedron. That is, we could stretch the bonds along the z-axis and compress the bonds in the xy plane. And that would give us exactly the opposite distortion. And if you look at this picture for a minute, you would conclude that you can't tell which one is going to happen because they're both going to lower the energy by basically the same amount. But if you were to spend some time studying the structures of molecules or crystals that have high spin D4 ions, that have D9 ions, what you would find is almost always we're going to get the elongated octahedron. And it's very, very rare to see the compressed octahedron. So what is it that stabilizes the elongated octahedron? Before we answer that question, let's think about another 
feature of crystal chemistry that is a little perplexing. When we look at molecules and crystals that have an ion with a D10 configuration, for example, mercury 2, sometimes we see a symmetric environment. Tetrahedron is not an unusual geometry. But when we go to the heavier ions, what we see predominantly is not octahedral or tetrahedral coordination, but instead we see a linear coordination. Now, what is responsible for this linear coordination? You could think of the linear coordination actually as that Jan Teller distortion, but the compressed version of it. So if we compress two bonds and stretch out the other four and the distortion is big enough, we're going to get something that looks linear. So here I show the bond distances for copper 2 bromide and mercury 2 bromide. We can see in the copper case, which is D9, we have four bonds that are 2.4 angstroms, and then the other two bonds are much, much longer. So this is four short, two long. That is our elongated octahedron. Whereas in mercury bromide, we have two short bonds and four long bonds. So this is the compressed octahedron. What causes this? Why do we even have a distortion for the D10 ions? What, what's the driving force for that? Now, to answer this question, we've got to consider actually the higher lying s orbital that's empty. So for copper, that would be the 4s orbital. For mercury, that would be the 6s orbital. And so what I've drawn is in the middle here, we have a regular octahedron. We have our eg orbitals, the dz squared, the dx squared minus y squared. They're at the same energy. Their symmetry by group theory is eg. And then up here, we would have our higher lying empty s orbital. And it has a 1g symmetry. Because the symmetries are different, there's no hybridization, there's no mixing. But once we either elongate or compress the octahedron, the symmetry is lowered. It's lowered in Herman Mogwin notation to 4 over MMM, and in Schoenfle's notation that would be D4H. What is the effect of that? Well, one effect of that is that the DZ squared orbital now has A1G symmetry, just like the S orbital. So because we have two orbitals, of the same symmetry, there's going to be some hybridization or mixing of them. This is very much like two lectures ago in MO theory, where we saw in the oxygen molecule that the S sigma and the P sigma MOs could mix. Same story here. S orbital is going to be destabilized, and the DZ squared orbital is going to be stabilized. And the reason why we want to have the elongation is because only when we elongate the octahedron do we lower the energy of the dz squared so it's doubly occupied in a d9 case. So because the dz squared orbital is doubly occupied and the dx squared minus y squared orbital is singly occupied, we get more stabilization than if we had the reverse distortion. And so that's why in the d9 case, this S dz squared mixing leads to the stabilization of an elongation of the octahedron. Now, in the D10 case, like with mercury, both the dx squared minus y squared and the dz squared orbitals are both doubly occupied. So in that case, it's more favorable to put the dz squared orbital up close in energy to the S orbital because by putting them close in energy, we can increase the amount of hybridization or mixing between them that's going to ultimately stabilize the dz squared. If we were to do the opposite distortion, we would still get some stabilization of the dz squared, but because the energy differential between the dz squared and the s is larger, that stabilization would be smaller. Okay, what about the second order Jan Teller distortion. Probably the poster child for second order Jan Teller distortion is the ammonia molecule. What I've drawn on the left here would be the MO diagram for an ammonia molecule with a hypothetical trigonal planar environment. All right, so what do we see? We can see that there's this 1A1 
prime. That's going to be the bonding interaction between the s orbital on nitrogen and the s orbitals on the hydrogen. We've got this 2a1 prime. That's the anti-bonding interaction between those orbitals. Then we've got this 1e prime. That is the bonding interaction between the 2px and the 2py orbitals on nitrogen with the s orbitals on hydrogen. And then the very highest lying MO here, the 2e prime, is, is the anti-bonding combination of that interaction. And then finally, we have right here this a2 double prime. That is the non-bonding pz orbital. So in trigonal planar ammonia, the PZ orbital cannot mix with any of the hydrogens, and so it's non-bonding. And that, it turns out, is our HOMO. Now, probably you all know that ammonia is not trigonal planar. It's trigonal pyramidal. And we can understand why through this second-order Jan Teller distortion. If we change the geometry from planar to pyramidal, we're going to change the symmetry in such a way that the PZ orbital has A1 symmetry, as does the S orbital. And so the really the key thing we want to focus on is right here. Now we can have a mixing, a hybridization, between the LUMO, which is this anti-bonding nitrogen 2S orbital, and the HOMO, which is this non-bonding PZ orbital. And when we mix them, we end up with a filled orbital that now is a little bit bonding, but mostly non-bonding. And then an empty orbital that is quite a bit anti-bonding. Because of the mixing of the PZ and the S, we get a large lobe of electron density that's pointed off to the side of the pyramid where the hydrogens don't exist. And so that drops it from being non-bonding to being weakly bonding. Now, we pay penalty for that in that this anti-bonding S orbital goes up in energy and becomes even more anti-bonding, but that's okay because we don't have any electrons there, so we don't actually pay that penalty. Right, so this is the second order Jan Teller distortion. It's driven when we have a small gap between a HOMO and a LUMO, and we can undergo a symmetry distortion that allows those two orbitals to obtain the same symmetry and therefore hybridize. And that hybridization stabilizes the filled HOMO. Another very classic example of the second order Jan Teller distortion that we see a lot in solid state chemistry. And for some kinds of materials like ferroelectrics, it's a very important kind of distortion would be one where we have a main group ion, like here, lead 2 plus, that has electrons in its valence shell s orbital. Right? So if we have a main group ion in an octahedron, here's our MO diagram. And the key thing to focus on is here's our HOMO, anti-bonding lead 6s with the chlorine. And here's our LUMO, anti-bonding lead 6p with the surrounding chlorides. So if we could do some kind of distortion of this molecule so that the S and the P could mix, it would lead to a stabilization of the molecule through a Jan Teller distortion. And to do that, what we need to do is we need to lower the octahedral symmetry. So if we were to distort the molecules so that lead would move up along the fourfold axis to make one short bond to a chlorine, and then one long bond to a chlorine. That's going to lead to this 4MM symmetry, uh, and that's going to stabilize the anti-bonding interaction between the lead 6S and the chlorides, while destabilizing the interaction between primarily the PZ orbital and the chlorides. So once again, this distortion, the lead moving out of the center of the octahedron toward one of the corners, is going to give us this occupied orbital, which is almost non-bonding. And so we call this a stereoactive electron lone pair distortion, right? which has a lot of parallels to what we might learn in VESPER. Right? If you go back a couple of slides to when I was talking about ammonia, we explain 
the trigonal pyramidal geometry of ammonia in general chemistry using Vesper theory. We need to have some place to put the sp3 hybrid orbital that's doubly occupied. Well, this is really the MO equivalent of that. Now, if you were to look at the crystal chemistry of lead, you would find a lot of these stereoactive electron lone pair distortions, which are really second order Jan Teller distortions. One example would be in PBO, which you might think could have uh, something like the cesium chloride structure. And its structure is related in some ways to the cesium chloride structure. But what's happened is the lead has shifted off the center toward one square face of its cube and that gives it four short bonds to these oxygens and then very long bonds to these oxygens on the top face. Right, and so here you can see the short bonds. We have a space in the crystal where we have room to put this electron lone pair, which if we go back to MO theory is going to be the HOMO and it's going to come from the antibonding filled 6S orbital on lead mixing with the empty PZ orbital. The other place we see these second order on Teller distortions a lot would be D0 transition metals that have a relatively high valence. So molybdenum-6, niobium-5, tantalum-5, titanium-4. These can also undergo second order on Teller distortions that cause the cation to shift out of the center of its coordination polyhedron. So those are discussed in, in chapter 8, and you may encounter that when you go on to Dr. Wu's class.